you, praise team, so much. It's so great to hear from you guys. Um, my voice is still recovering from ISAC, so I apologize. But right now, we're going to take the time, and you're going to get to hear from another one of your teachers, the one and only Mr. Davis. So let's give it up for him. Okay, great. Um, I think we're going to need two microphones here. So can I? Oh, oh, look at that. Let me just get my questions that I have for you here. So we're talking about how God gives us a new heart this year. This is our theme. And one of the things that we're trying to do is at chapel give you guys an opportunity to hear from different teachers about changes that God has caused in their hearts. And I'm really excited that Mr. Davis agreed to do this today. So, you know, a lot of people see you in the hall. They, you teach them math and science. And they just think, friendly, present, Mr. Davis, he's just always been here. But that's not the case, is it? So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you were doing before you came to Vice? Where did you live? And what was your life like? All right. Uh, let's see. So for my first 40 years of life, so I'm getting a little bit old at this point, um, except for the four years at university, uh, I lived pretty much on the same street as my family. So I grew up on a farm. Um, my uncles owned a farm. I worked on the farm during the summer. Uh, so for those of you that enjoy summer breaks, the day that school ended, the next day I was up at 6 o'clock in the morning ready to get out into the fields and work. Um, so my school days or my summer days went from 6 in the morning to about 8 at night every day. Um, doing farm labor stuff. So I grew up on a family farm um, in my hometown, and so uh, the whole neighborhood was uh, my brothers and sisters, my aunts and uncles, my grandparents. It was just that whole street out in the middle of nowhere. Wow. Um, we had our own little compound just out in the The Davis the compound. Yeah, uh, yeah. We actually called it Davisville. Um, there was no name for the place. Wow. Um, we, we got the, uh, the, the government people to name our road Davis Road. Um, again, it was just a gravel road for a long time. So that's kind of where I grew up. Um, so before coming here, uh, I did teach in a, uh, in a public kind of, uh, I say rural, rural, I don't ever have, pronouncing that word is hard for me, R-U-R-A-L. Yeah. Even as English speakers yes. struggle. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was kind of its own little weird inner city type public school in the middle of a uh, small town and so it was a it was a tough situation but um, I taught math to uh, mostly uh, 10th 11th and 12th graders okay. and then I spent usually four nights a week at basketball games um, helping mm. teach stats and stuff so that was kind of where I was just like right before coming here okay so you had some pretty deep roots it sounds like in the community um, that you were uh, working and living and raising your family in. So then when and how did you begin considering an international ministry? Um, well, to kind of go back a little bit further, my wife spent four years in Shanghai, and so uh, she kind of already had uh, that heart for kind of international um, ministry at that point. And so once we got married, I'm still a very, um, I enjoy being at home. I enjoy not having any change, being in the same uh, situation I've always been in. Um, so we actually looked at, uh, when Ryan was like one year old, we looked at going overseas to teach at that time. And that was in the middle of one of the big uh, economic crises. And so there wasn't a lot of schools hiring at that point. Um, so we kind of continued doing what we were doing. Um, and we knew over the last couple of years when we were in the States that God was ready to move us somewhere. And our calling, we felt, was kind of working with uh, international students. And um, we actually had a job lined up that we would still be working with international students, but it was going to be in a college setting. Okay. Um, 
sorry, this fly is I really know, bothering me. I know, being attacked me. up here um, by a fly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the doing leadership training in college settings from a yeah. Christian perspective. Um, but <laughs> I'm blaming uh, Enrique for this <laughs> fly. Um, no, but we were planning on doing that, and um, we had this idea that we may teach, we may go overseas, but it wasn't something that, that I personally wanted to do. Yeah. Um, again, because change is not something that I mm-hmm. look forward to. Um, I really, really like being comfortable. And yeah, so the idea of moving a family of six overseas was not even something that I really considered much. So then how did that lead you here to Indonesia? Um, well, we actually had looked at, uh, some of you have taken the North Star classes here. Um, my wife and I actually looked at applying, and we did apply uh, for North Star teaching, um, mostly because it would give us freedom to kind of pursue some of the other um, jobs, the other job we were looking at, too. And so we started out with that, and then through that process, uh, one of the uh, people that worked at Nix mentioned to us that she really thought our family would be a good fit for our school in Bandung. And I just kind of looked at her because I'm sitting here going, I have no clue where Bandung is. Um, Indonesia is like, yes, it's a foreign country, but it's a foreign concept to me. Like I have, I knew it was somewhere over here and there was a lot of people and that's really about all I knew. Um, I knew it was a longer word, kind of started the same as India, but it didn't finish the same way, (laughs) you know. It was longer, yeah. So I, just, I didn't know anything about Indonesia. Mm-hmm. And so um, the only place that we'd considered going was back to China, which yeah. is you know where, where my wife had spent some time. So um, once that was mentioned um, to us, like I really kind of blew it off. Um, but then there was that little piece in my head of maybe God's getting us to go somewhere again. Yeah. Um, and so this is kind of had this one probably fly. Yeah. Um, sorry about that, guys. Um, so, so yeah, that just kind of began to kind of open up that, that door and that thought process um, where we ended up contacting Mr. Nielsen at that time and had a couple of just uh, email conversations. And we, oh, we, the other job we were planning to do, we had a training scheduled in Texas. Um, and so that was going to be a trip, but they ended up canceling that training, and it was on the same day as the job fair at Nick's headquarters. And uh, the Nick's headquarters is about an hour and a half from my house. So we went to that instead. Okay. Um, and that's where we first met, or first heard really about Bice's mission, and met Mr. Nielsen and uh, Miss Santori, uh, not Miss Santori, uh, yeah, yeah, Miss Santori. Um, we met them there and got to kind of do a first interview with them at that time. Um, and then, yeah, they told us at that time we'd love to do another interview, and so we started to look at that, but I still at that time wasn't really wanting to go, I guess. Yeah, um, so that's, that's kind of my question is what were those challenges that you were experiencing before finally making that decision to move here to Bandung? and serve here at Weiss. Why was this a hard decision for you? Um, A few pieces. One, moving a family with four young kids away from all of their family, (laughs) all of their cousins. Uh, So I know a few of you have large families here. Um, We did too. My kids, we lived with my aunt the last few years. Um, And so they would just get up in the morning and they would go next door to play with, with their cousins. And so like, it really was just a family situation. So pulling them away and yeah. just even considering taking them to the other side of the world was very difficult for me to think about. Um, the other piece is the school I was in, it's a really tough school to teach in. And so having, having teachers there that are committed to being there yeah. was very hard. We would have teachers for usually one or two years right out of college, and then they would leave and go somewhere else. And so having some people that were committed to being there um, was something that wasn't common, and so that made it another piece that was kind of hard to leave. And then last for me, again, is just my comfort. Yeah. Uh, I really struggled with, with even considering going somewhere else. So then how did God change your heart, and what was the result of that change? Um, yeah, so after our second interview with, with Bice, uh, 
and they, they offered us a job, and I told them I was going to need some time. And I know a few of the teachers here have been through that same exact process uh, where you just you want to be willing to do what God wants, but you're not positive it is what God wants, and you're not sure if it's your own fears or your own worries and that kind of stuff. And so I was just, we were doing a lot of praying. My wife and I would meet at lunch every day, um, and we would fast during lunch, and we would pray together and talk through pros and cons and what does this what does this look like for our family um and so about a week after uh, we had been offered the job and we still hadn't told my family this at all so like this was me and Alicia just just kind of really praying and digging in deep um I was going to a uh student-led uh I guess they called it a bible club bible club or prayer club um, our school, our high school, 9 through 12, had about 500 students. And this one um, 10th grade student, maybe 11th grade at that time, um, had been committed to leading this club, of which sometimes some other students would show up and sometimes it would just be her. But she did this every, every week. And there were three of us teachers that kind of joined in too. And she actually... Uh, I'll be honest, I'm not sure what the lesson was about that she was kind of speaking on that day, um, but the verse that stuck out, stuck out to me was in 1 Thessalonians, um, and it just said, uh, let me get the words in here right, it's pretty much whatever, uh, whatever he leads you, he will take care of, and so if he, if he tells you, if he says it, he will mm. do it, and it just kind of put that peace in me yeah. at that moment of if this is what I feel God's telling me to do, he's going to take care of all the details. Hmm. Um, and for me, those details were my heart and being willing to go, but also that he would take care of my kids, he would take care of my yeah. family, um, because it was not just me going somewhere else, but it was the family back home also losing, not that they wanted they cared about losing me as much, but I did have four little girls that they really, really, really love. Yeah. And so missing them too, but knowing that he would take care and just that reminder. Um, so yeah, my one, one big thing for me, guys, even if you're the only one standing up and doing what you feel like God's calling you to do, do it because you don't know who's going to need what you're saying. You know, like this, this girl literally in a class at a school of five, yeah. 600 people was the only one um, that was doing this and she was very committed to it. But yeah. And I wonder if she knows what a big impact that's had. Um, she definitely didn't initially because I didn't say anything to yeah. her. I had actually went back to my room and just cried um, after she had after the, the, yeah. the lesson. Um, but I had uh, I, I don't know about a week or so, two couple weeks after we accepted the position, which was within just a couple of days of this of this time. Um, I would actually wrote like a like a Facebook post and tagged her okay. her mom. Okay. Um, yeah. And so. I just like I wanted her to know that what she's doing meant something, um, even when she felt like nobody was listening. So, yeah, and I think that um, that verse from First Thessalonians five, I think that's where Paul says, "The one who calls you is faithful; he will do it." Yeah. And so you, that's what really that trust that God was faithful and that He would provide what was needed is what allowed you to actually orient your heart towards what he was calling you to. So then what advice would you give someone? Because I'm, I'm sure those of us here, we have things that we feel God wanting to change in our lives, wanting us to do, and we just don't honestly desire it. What would your advice be to those of us that might be struggling with that? Whew, um, does anybody in here ever wonder like what God has in store for you? Like, what's your purpose in life? Okay. Um, if you're not, you need to listen a little closer because you're probably needing to wonder anyway. <laughs> um, no, I... First, definitely have someone you can talk to that is um, mature in their faith. And so that could be a friend. That could be an adult. But you need to have someone you can talk to because if you're dealing with something that you feel like God's calling you to do, you need to be able to talk with it and hear feedback and wisdom from someone um, because they can encourage you. Like my wife and I encouraged each other, but I think it yeah. probably, we actually talked to, there was two people um, outside of our community that we talked to 
And so we kind of got feedback from them, and so that was helpful. Um, but having somebody that can kind of speak and say, no, that's not what God's calling you to do. Yeah. Because sometimes it is just what we want to do. Um, sure. Or sometimes it goes against what Scripture says. Yeah. If God's not going to call you to something that he's already said is not a good thing. Okay. And so, but if you're struggling with that, it's, it's more of dig into the word. Um, there is that concept of fasting that mm -hmm. God calls us to as we're making decisions and choices for him. Um, which for the most part is giving up food, but it's giving up food for a purpose. Yeah. And that purpose is to dig deep into prayer. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's something you should do year round <laughs> for your health purposes, but for hearing what God is calling you to do, it's a, it's a very effective piece. Um, especially when you're looking at it in a, I want to spend time with God listening for a specific purpose. Um, and then just guys be willing. Um, it's not easy to do something big. It's not easy to do small things sometimes. Yeah. Um, but be willing and open to say, if this is what God wants, he is faithful and just yeah. and will take care of it. So what I'm hearing you say is talk to people that you can trust. And we have all these teachers here that yeah. would love to talk to any of you if that's something you want to talk about, if you're wondering what God's calling you to. Uh, consider God's word what's really true, right? We have what's true and needing to think about that first, but then also having that willing heart and willing and being willing to seek him through prayer and fasting and see what is it, am I willing to hear him and follow him? Yeah, and then I know a lot of you make plans for your life, like now. Just be in your head, know that God may change those. He yeah. may be keeping you with that plan, but there are also chances that he's yeah. moving you in a different direction too. Great. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Davis. Let's hear it for Mr. Davis. Um. Well, yeah, God, I thank you so much for today, and I thank you for all the people here um, right now, and I just, um, yeah, I thank you for this message shared by Mr. Davis, and I really pray that the things that we hear today at this chapel and the things that we hear from you in our every, everyday lives, that it will make an impact on us and that our hearts will be open to it, and yeah, I just pray that as we are all here in, um, in school and in the um, mindset of work and um, doing what we can for academics that and for relationships. I just pray that you'll come to meet us here today and that our um, eyes, ears, and hearts will be open to what you have to say to us. And yeah, I just pray that we will be willing to listen to you and follow what you call us to do. Thanks so much, Aiden. Um, so, we're just going to, I really appreciate Mr. Davis coming up and sharing about that experience because something that's always interested me in my own spiritual growth and I know from talking with a lot of you is how do we go to actually wanting the things that God wants, right? So we've been talking about a new heart and when we've been talking about the heart, we've, we've understood this to be not just you know, my, my feelings of love and emotions. Yes, it does include emotions, but it includes my will, my decisions, my choices, and my desires. So how does God actually get involved and take someone like Mr. Davis who didn't want to do something and change him and transform his very desires? And this had me thinking about Romans 6. And so we're going to look at a couple verses from from Romans 6 that helps us kind of understand this process that happens. How does that change happen? Where Paul says, but thanks be to God. Well, I can still see it on this one. I'll read it with you here. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart. So this is an obedience that comes from the heart to that form of teaching which you were entrusted. So basically to the teaching that you were given. 
So how does that happen? And what's really significant about what we see in this passage is that it's something that you were before you were slaves to sin, and you became something new. And this is really at the core of the biblical model for transformation and how we are changed. Because I think it's easy to look at what we think God wants for us, and we think, what I need to do is try really hard to become that. But if you've tried that, you've probably also encountered a lot of failure, right? That, that is hard to just muster up the effort within ourselves to make that really change and really happen. So what this comes down to, this is how we often think about transformation. We think, okay, there's something wrong in my life. Maybe it's a wrong attitude. Maybe it's a bad habit. Maybe I'm dishonest. Maybe I'm perpetually insecure. There's some kind of problem. And what I need to do is replace that with the right behavior, with the right action. And then will that really lead to change? And oftentimes when we're approaching this in terms of our own resources and our own strength, we can get pretty defeated pretty quickly. And so the biblical picture is actually one that begins with identity, that God actually changes who we are. Like Luffy, right? This might be a, if you've ever read any One Piece or watched any One Piece, you know that early on in Luffy's journey, he has an encounter with some devil fruit, and it changes him right? He actually becomes a different person, right? All of a sudden, he, ha he can bend and stretch, and he has all these powers that he did not have before. He, it's not that he just works really hard and eventually learns how to do these things with his body. He has to undergo a transformation. So he becomes somebody new because of this interaction with the devil fruit, right? Okay, just just so that we, just an example that maybe some of you can connect with to see the transformation is what results in change. So, and this is what Paul says happens to us in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. So this is what we're being told in scripture, that Jesus has actually made us new. He's not just trying to patch up the old. He has made us a new creation. And maybe this is something you've heard before and you're thinking, okay, but what do I do with that information that Christ has made me new? How does, do I not have to do anything? What part do I have in this? What is this process? And so this is where we can get some additional insights from Romans 6. And I'm going to go through these quickly for the sake of time. But Paul, over and over again, uh, makes this point, look, because you're a new creation and you're under grace, it doesn't mean that you just can go on sinning. That's not who you are. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Right? Change comes by us realizing who we are. And he points this out. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? later in 6 and 7, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. And then later in verse 9, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. And so over and over again, right, all my inductive study students here should know if there's a repetition of a word, it's important, right? And so where do we start with change? It's with what we know. It's what is true, right? And I liked how Mr. Davis pointed that out as, as we're trying to figure it out. We go, what does the Bible say? What is true? What has God said to us? And so, you know, think about someone like Harry Potter. So Harry Potter was just some orphan living under his aunt and uncle's stairs, right? That's all he thought he was. But that wasn't true. That's not who he really was. He really was this wizarding child, you know. And he gets this letter 
and eventually uh, some visitors that tell him that's not who you are. This is who you are. And it changes the course of his whole life. But Paul says knowing is just the first step. So you too consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. And this is actually an accounting term that Paul is using here, right? Saying like, count yourself to be someone who is a new creation in Christ. So for Harry Potter, it wasn't enough for him to just know this. He had to actually believe it. He had to actually view himself, not as how he had thought of himself his whole life. That was probably pretty difficult, right? But to all of a sudden view himself and be like, all right, I'm going to live as if I really am a wizard. Or I'm going to live as if I really am a new creation. And then finally he says, you don't offer the parts of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather you offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought back from death to life. And so there is that willingness that Mr. Davis was talking about, that seeking God, that honest willingness. But this process is not one where we go, I have to stop doing this or I need to become more like this and and just trying to modify our behavior. The kind of transformation that God wants to give us and giving us a new heart It's a real and lasting change. And the ability to see the very things that we desire change so that they align with what God would want. So it might look a little bit more like this. So I look at the the actions in my life. Maybe that's resisting God's will. Maybe that's other problems. Maybe that's anger. Maybe that's hate. Maybe that's dishonesty. Whatever it is. And instead of trying to replace those with the right actions, I'm thinking, what are the things that I'm believing that aren't true? What are the things I'm believing about myself that I have to take care of myself, that I have to do this on my own, that I have to fix this on my own, versus I am a new creation. The one who's called me is faithful. He will do it. Right When I start to replace those wrong beliefs with the truth and with right beliefs, then I can offer myself to God with willingness and allow him to support me and enable me to do the right things. And this, through a gradual process, can result in real lasting transformation. And I don't mean to make this sound simpler than it is. I don't mean to pretend like it's as easy as a little Canva flowchart, because I know it's not, and you know it's not. But what I hope you walk away with is that God is not just interested with external obedience. He wants obedience from your heart. This isn't about getting you to just to follow the rules. This is about getting at your heart and transforming your heart. And you can go to him in honesty when you do not desire the things that he wants for your life. And you can bring that to him and ask him, what are the wrong things I'm believing, Lord? And how can I replace that thinking with your truth? And you can, over time, see him lead you to places you never thought you would go, and you're actually happy about it, right? That's the kind of God we have, and that's the kind of things that he wants to do in our hearts. Let me pray for us, and we'll bring up the worship team again. Father God, thank you so much for this example that we got to hear from Mr. Davis of how you moved in his heart to to lead him somewhere where he did not initially want to go. And how through that, you demonstrated your great love and faithfulness to him and his family and have blessed so many of us here at Vice because of that, God. I pray for those of us here that find that same struggle in our hearts, God. Help us to come to you, to trust you, to believe what you say about us 
and a trust that you will provide what we need so that we can offer ourselves to you in a spirit of willingness. In your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, that's that, guys. for this day, Lord. We thank you for everything that um, is well said. And we thank you for our voice, that it's back now. And um, we pray that we would um, use this day to always worship you and listen to what you say. Amen. <laughs>